Hello everyone, this is Dr. Gary Siskin, and today I'm going to be speaking on lumbar punctures. This is another entry in my In the Trenches lecture series, and these lectures are meant to focus on topics that a lot of people do during the course of their day, but that few people talk about or care about seeing in lectures when they attend large specialty meetings. In fact, it may even be hard to find lectures on some of these topics at meetings because they're just not considered cool enough to talk about in that setting. So let's embrace our uncoolness and talk a little bit about lumbar punctures. More than a century ago, Heinrich Quinke uh, was credited with introducing the LP for diagnostic and therapeutic purposes. And recently, radiologies had a growing role in the performance of these procedures due to the increasing use of image guidance in selected patients. If we're going to talk about lumbar punctures, there's a little bit of background that I think we have to get out of the way. For starters, where is our target? Well, our target during an LP is the lumbar cistern, and this is the subarachnoid space inferior to the spinal cord. In order to access this space safely and proficiently, I think we have to understand the anatomy of the lumbar spine and the terminal spinal cord, as well as the soft tissue structures within the spinal canal. The spinal canal termination varies in most people from T12 all the way down to L3-4. Cadaver studies have shown that the mean level of spinal cord termination is at the L1, L2 disc space. MRI studies have also been performed, and they've shown that the spinal cord terminates a little higher at the middle to lower third of L1. These studies have shown that almost a quarter of patients will have their spinal cord terminate below L1, and about 1% terminate below L2, L3. If imaging is available, it should definitely be reviewed to help determine the position of the conus prior to an LP. It's also important to have a cursory understanding of how the lumbar vertebra are aligned. And this is important because you need to know where your needle is supposed to go during an LP, and we want our needle to pass through the interlaminar space when performing these procedures. We'll discuss that a little bit more when we talk about imaging guidance. With this in mind, the last things to understand are the structures that the needle will pass through while performing the lumbar puncture. First is the supraspinous ligament, and this connects the tips of the spinous processes. The interspinous ligament runs between the adjacent borders of the spinous processes, and then there's the ligamentum flavum, and this spans the interlaminar space between adjacent vertebra, and it can be up to one centimeter thick in the lumbar region. In addition, this ligament may be calcified in older patients. Next, the needle is going to enter the epidural space, and this is the fat-containing space between the ligamentum flavum and the dura. It contains nerve roots and the internal vertebral venous plexus. The distance the needle advances after entering the epidural space through the ligamentum flavum before penetrating the dura is only seven millimeters. So you don't want to move too fast when advancing your needle at this point of the procedure. When we look at the meninges, the dura is the outer layer, the arachnoid is the middle layer, and the pia mater is the inner layer. The subdural space, which is between the dura and arachnoid, is a potential space, while the subarachnoid space is where the CSF can be found. And remember, this is between the arachnoid and the pia mater. Given the fact that the goal of an LP is to remove CSF, it also makes sense to understand the physiology of CSF, especially in the context of an LP lecture. 80% of the CSF is produced by the choroid plexus within the ventricles, while the rest is produced by the ependymal surface of the ventricles, the arachnoid membranes, and by brain tissue itself. CSF secretion is both passive and active. Passive secretion is due to ultrafiltration of plasma from the fenestrated capillary network into the choroid plexus. And active CSF secretion involves multiple ion channels on the epithelial surface of the choroid plexus. The total volume of CSF in adults is approximately 125 to 150 milliliters, which is divided between the brain and the spinal cord. CSF is secreted from the choroid plexus at a rate of 25 cc's per hour. You can also think of it as 0.2 to 0.7 cc's per minute, or 500 to 700 cc's per day.
there is a circulation pattern to CSF once it's produced. The CSF produced in the later, lateral ventricles flows through the intraventricular foramina into the third ventricle and then to the fourth ventricle via the cerebral aqueduct. The CSF drains from the fourth ventricle via the foramina of Lushka and the foramen of Magendi into the subarachnoid space near the pontine cistern. And some of that CSF flows into the spinal subarachnoid space, which extends all the way inferiorly to the lumbar cistern. The CSF is subsequently absorbed through a combination of lymphatic absorption and by arachnoid villi projecting into the venous sinuses. This permits the unidirectional flow of CSF into the systemic blood and acts as a one-way valve. The rate of absorption of the CSF through the arachnoid villi controls the CSF pressure. CSF has two important functions. The first is to prevent brain damage by mechanical injury, and in this way it's acting as a shock absorber. The second function is to serve as a medium for the transfer of nutrients and waste products to and from the brain tissue, which is what's helpful to us as we draw fluid out to analyze it in the context of several medical conditions. So when we do an LP, our goals are to obtain CSF for laboratory analysis and to measure CSF pressure. Many disease conditions can alter the composition and pressure of CSF, and the analysis of this fluid can help in diagnosis, prognosis, and response to therapy. There are several indications for a lumbar puncture. The first is for a suspected CNS infection, and this is usually done in a patient presenting with some combination of fever, altered mental status, headache, or meningeal signs. You also may use it for a suspected subarachnoid hemorrhage if a patient has a negative CT scan or MRI. And it's also used to evaluate other neurological conditions such as idiopathic intracranial hypertension, normal pressure hydrocephalus, CNS syphilis or vasculitis, MS, and other conditions. A lumbar puncture can also be used as a procedural adjunct during spinal anesthesia, the injection of contrast from myelography, or the intrathecal administration of chemotherapy or antibiotics. And I just want to touch on that for a minute because right now we're principally injecting two medications intrathecally. The first is methotrexate, and this is used in patients with leukemia or lymphoma and CNS involvement. The intrathecal dose is usually 6 to 15 milligrams, and the complications may include headache, seizures, coma, neurologic deficits, aphasia, and cardiovascular compromise. And aminophilin at a rate of 2 to 5 milligrams per kilogram is a competitive agonist of adenosine and can be used uh, to treat neurotoxicity that's mediated by methotrexate. The other drug that we find ourselves injecting is cytarabine, and this is used to treat meningeal leukemia, brain tumors, and uh, lymphoma, and disseminated malignancies. The dose of this medication is 50 milligrams, and its use can be associated with a chemical arachnoiditis with headache, back pain, fever, nausea, and vomiting, and this can be minimized with the use of systemic dexamethasone. Another potential indication is fluid removal and idiopathic intracranial hypertension. In the past, serial lumbar punctures were used for symptomatic relief, but this really should not be the case any longer. The headache relief from an LP is typically short-lived since the rate of CSF secretion is 25 milliliters per hour. Therefore, the volume removed in a, in a so-called therapeutic LP is rapidly replaced. Treatment should probably focus on weight loss and CSF shunt placement since these treatments are effective in this condition. An LP can be considered to temporarily preserve vision in cases where vision is rapidly deteriorating prior to CSF shunt placement. An increased risk of CNS herniation is considered a contraindication to LP. So these include conditions associated with elevated intracranial pressure because they can potentially lead to CNS herniation if CSF is removed during an LP. In these conditions, there's a baseline CSF pressure gradient above and below the level of obstruction. When CSF is removed below the obstruction, that pressure gradient is transiently accentuated. The change in the pressure gradient can be enough to cause movement of CNS tissue out of its normal position, and this can involve brain, spinal cord, and nerve root tissue, potentially with devastating consequences. So any patient with suspected increased intracranial pressure should be imaged to rule out a possible mass lesion and other explanations before performing the LP. An increased risk of bleeding is also considered a contraindication to LP. 
This can be seen in thrombocytopenia or other bleeding diatheses. And an INR greater than 1.5 or a platelet count less than 50,000 is considered a relative contraindication due to the risk of bleeding, hematoma formation, and the potential for neurologic sequela. Just realize this is an inconsistent recommendation since, since I've seen platelet count thresholds as low as 40,000 and as high as 75,000. We also want to think about patients who are on ongoing anticoagulation or antiplatelet medication. I've included these charts for your review outside of listening to this lecture. Uh, I think certainly in some patients we have to accept the risk of bleeding and perform the lumbar puncture, but in others, correcting the underlying abnormality or drug effect makes sense in order to reduce the risk of bleeding. With all the different medications available now, you're frequently going to ask, when do we stop the medication and when can we restart it? And these charts are, are good references for a future use. An increased risk of infection is another potential contraindication. This includes a local infection at the site of LP access and a suspected spinal epidural access. And other much less common contraindications include a low-lying conus, a tethered spinal cord, and a myelomeningocele. So even though this is an interventional radiology lecture on lumbar punctures, let's not forget that most of these are and certainly should be done at bedside. A bedside LP is something that should be attempted first for most patients. It's certainly possible to do. It's less costly than an image-guided lumbar puncture, and there's no need to take up the time of a technologist, a radiologist, and the use of a fluoroscopy machine. There's no need to use imaging equipment for a procedure that doesn't require it. There's also, of course, no need to expose patients to unnecessary radiation. We usually only consider an image-guided LP after a failed bedside attempt, and contributing factors for this might include obesity, severe degenerative disc disease, and scoliosis. So most image-guided LPs are performed with the patient in the prone position. However, the presence of surgical incisions, drainage catheters, respiratory equipment or injuries might not allow that, so you need to also be prepared to do this with the patient in the lateral decubitus position. A prone position allows for better anatomical visualization and is less prone to motion. It can also, however, cause generally narrower interlaminar spaces and slower CSF flow. Remember, the interlaminar space can be widened by placing a pillow under the abdomen. Our goal when selecting the site where we're going to puncture is to choose an access site that's below the tip of the conus but above the sacrum since the canal narrows at that point and the distance from the skin to the thecal sac increases. So I generally prefer L3-4 for access. That's because the likelihood of a traumatic puncture at L4-5 is nearly double compared to L2-3 and L3-4 and this could be due to increased degeneration in the lower spine. In addition, access at L2-3 can lead to injury of the conus medullaris in up to 20% of patients, and this can result in intramedullary hemorrhage and small infarcts, causing symptoms including foot drop, numbness, sphincter disturbance, and weakness. Now, of course, since you have imaging, you should use imaging to choose the level for access. The level chosen should be the level that appears most unobstructed by osteophytes, degenerative loss of disc height, or changes from prior surgery. And the ideal level has a vertebral body as the backstop rather than a disc. The interlaminal laminar spaces are usually readily visualized in younger patients, but degenerative osteophytes, kyphosis, and scoliosis might obscure them in other patients. Rotating the C-arm 5 to 10 degrees laterally and 5 to 10 degrees caudally usually results in good visualization of the interlaminar spaces. Here's an image from a procedure in addition to a model of the spine, and I think you can easily see the um, lighter interlaminar spaces just below each of the spinous processes. And by rotating the C-arm slightly um, laterally and slightly caudally, you can see how those interlaminar spaces open up and become an even better target for lumbar puncture. Most people use a 20 gauge or 22 gauge needle for an LP. That's because smaller gauge needles bend more easily upon placement, and they also may not measure opening pressure accurately. A standard needle is three inches or 7.6 centimeters long. Remember, obese patients may need a longer needle, and they are available measuring 5.5 inches or 14 centimeters. Quinky needles, which are the first and second needles pictured here, are the most commonly used. 
They have an opening at the end of the needle and a sharp cutting tip. Atraumatic needles are also available, and they're designed to separate elastic fibers, but the problem is that they're more expensive and therefore not as commonly used. When using these needles, the flat surface of the bevel of the needle should be pointed towards the right or left side of the patient so that the needle spreads rather than cuts the dural fibers. Remember, the dural fibers run parallel to the spinal axis. As a result, the fibers return to their original position after removal of the needle, which minimizes damage to the dura and potentially decreases the likelihood of a headache. As you're passing the needle, resistance will be felt as the needle passes through the spinal ligaments and through the dura. A give or a pop will be felt as the needle enters the subarachnoid space. Once the needle is in the right place, we often want to obtain an opening pressure. Plastic tubing is connected to the needle, and a stopcock and manometer are attached to the other end of the tubing. The tubing should be maintained in a horizontal position. We're then going to watch the CSF go into the manometer, and we're going to wait until the meniscus stops rising and only respiratory fluctuation is present. This may take a few minutes. The pressure is normally 10 to 20 centimeters of water, and greater than 25 is considered pathological. Transient elevations in CSF pressure may be seen during a Valsalva maneuver, when the patient is shouting or crying, and potentially from abdominal compression. The prone positioning during an image-guided LP does have implications on measuring the CSF pressure. The manometer is typically kept at the level of the needle hub when you're measuring pressures in the prone position. Since the zero point should be at the level of the heart, the distance between the heart and manometer must be accounted for in the pressure reading. As a result, this distance in centimeters should be estimated and added to the pressure reading. If it's not done, then the pressure is being underestimated. In addition, just being in the prone position can overestimate the opening pressure compared to a lateral decubitus position, but this difference is not felt to be clinically significant. So once we're done measuring pressures, we're going to start collecting fluid, and specimens are usually collected sequentially in four tubes. Look for the numbers on the tubes and collect the fluid sequentially. Two to three cc's of CSF per tube are usually required in most clinical situations. So you're most certainly going to face patients where the CSF flow is poor, and there are several factors causing this. There can be an inappropriate needle placement against bone or a nerve root. There might be local obstruction to flow, and there may also be low CSF pressure. This is most often due to dehydration, which is why pre-procedure hydration is a good idea, especially in inpatients. Outpatients should be instructed to drink, to drink liberally. You certainly don't want to aspirate fluid from the subarachnoid space. This can lead to increased pain. It may plug the needle tip with a nerve or arachnoid membrane, and it may lead to a risk of herniation. So if you have poor flow, you should image in the AP and lateral projections and reposition the needle as necessary, which often means advancing or pulling back the needle. You can rotate the needle 90 to 180 degrees since it might be indenting the anterior dura or flow might be obstructed by an adjacent nerve root. You can also tilt the table up to 45 degrees to fill the lumbar cistern, and you can also have the patient cough or perform a Valsalva maneuver. So now we're going to get the fluid out, and now we have to analyze it. And the first thing we're going to do is look at it, because normal CSF should be clear and colorless. The CSF can be abnormal without affecting the clarity of the fluid. It can be viscous if the patient has severe meningitis, cryptococcal meningitis, or metastatic mucinous adenocarcinoma. Bloody CSF can be seen with hemorrhage or a traumatic tap. Now, a traumatic tap usually occurs due to the needle being placed too far laterally or advanced too far anteriorly. The internal vertebral venous plexus in the epidural space is usually involved in a bloody tap. If there is a traumatic tap, the fluid generally clears after the first and second tubes are filled. The presence of clot in one of the tubes strongly favors a traumatic tap. The fluid may also be xanthochromic, and that's pictured in this image. This can be seen with subarachnoid and intracerebral hemorrhage, a traumatic tap, jaundice, elevated protein level, meningeal malignant melanoma, and hyperkeratinemia. In the event of bleeding, the color change is due to RBC lysis and the generation of bilirubin due to the breakdown of hemoglobin products. 
Remember, red blood cells undergo lysis in the CSF within two to four hours. Once we're done looking at the CSF, we're going to send it to the lab, and we're going to ask for several routine tests. And these include cell count differential, protein, and glucose. When we're looking at the cell count differential, we need to remember there's not normally a high number of white blood cells in the CSF. The white blood cell count helps acutely determine the presence or absence of meningitis. Viral meningitis usually has less than 100 white blood cells per milliliter. Non-infectious reasons for increased cell counts include leukemia, bleeding, and inflammation from any source. Keep in mind that pretreatment with oral antibiotics for several days prior to an LP usually has little effect on spinal cellular response. A cell count is also helpful in evaluating the number of red blood cells within the CSF, and this will play a role in differentiating between a bleed and a traumatic tap. And just remember that the number of red blood cells will decrease in consecutive tubes with a traumatic tap. When we're looking at CSF protein, 80% of that is plasma derived and 20% is due to intrathecal synthesis. And there are several reasons why you might see increased protein in CSF. It may be due to lysis of blood from a traumatic tap. There may be increased permeability of the blood-brain barrier, such as with a hemorrhage or meningitis. There might be increased production by CNS tissue due to inflammation, and there might be obstruction due to a tumor or abscess. CSF protein is elevated in 80% of patients with leptomeningeal metastases. And finally, we're gonna look at glucose. Glucose is actively transported across the blood-brain barrier, so CSF glucose levels are directly proportional to plasma levels. That's why simultaneous measurement in CSF and blood is recommended. Normal CSF glucose is 50 to 60% of serum values. Low CSF glucose can be seen in infections, hypoglycemia, and tumor infiltration. High CSF glucose levels really have no significant diagnostic significance and are usually due to spillover from an elevated blood glucose level. They can also be seen, however, in a traumatic tap. So depending on why we're doing the spinal tap, we may want to get microbiology involved. And first, we may want a gram stain done because this can supply information regarding the presence of infection as well as the type of organism present. And it's positive in 80% of patients with bacterial meningitis. False negatives, however, can occur in cases of partially treated meningitis or in patients who've received antibiotics. Other causes include syphilis, bacteremia, Lyme disease, and TB. A culture can also be performed, and the yield from CSF culture in bacterial meningitis is upwards of 70 to 85%. Less than 50% of cultures will be positive in patients who've received antibiotics. PCR has emerged as the gold standard for detecting viruses and can also be used to detect bacteria. CSF cytology is something we also might order. This is the gold standard for leptomeningeal carcinomatosis and can be used in CNS lymphoma or leukemia. But the likelihood of a positive result is influenced by several factors. First is the volume of CSF. High volumes, such as 5 to 10 cc's, can lead to lower false negative rates. Fluid should be obtained from the site of radiographic disease because that can impact the positivity of a test. The time to analysis is important also. Samples should be obtained during regular daytime hours so you don't have to sit and wait too long before it's analyzed. This is because cells within the CSF can lyse very quickly. And then there's the frequency of sampling. Malignant cells are shed into the CSF only periodically, so more than one sample is often needed to obtain a positive cytology result. Immunology is also playing a, an increasingly important role here. A band analysis can be used to assist in identifying immune-mediated CNS disorders, such as MS. And isolated CSF bands may also be present in perineoplastic disorders, lupus, neurosarcoidosis, cerebral angiitis, and CNS infections. You might also look for CSF antibodies, and these can be helpful in diagnosing autoimmune conditions. And finally, CSF biomarkers are emerging and will likely be used in the future to improve diagnostic accuracy and to monitor therapy in a variety of neurological diseases. So we're all done and we want to remove the needle and I just want you to remember to put the stylet back in the needle before removing it because this may prevent a suction effect when removing the needle which might result in trauma or nerve root entrapment. Replacing the needle may help reduce the incidence of a post-LP headache as well.
after the LP, patients should rest in the horizontal position to give the puncture a chance to heal. We recommend no strenuous activity for at least 24 hours, as well as adequate hydration. When we talk about potential complications, the thing we most often discuss is the post-LP headache. And there isn't a formal definition of this from the International Headache Society. This is a headache occurring within five days of an LP caused by CSF leakage through the dural puncture. It's usually accompanied by neck stiffness and or subjective hearing symptoms. It remits spontaneously within one week or after sealing of the leak with autologous epidural lumbar patch. As I mentioned, this is the most common complication of a dural puncture. Up to 90% of these headaches start within the first 72 hours after LP, which means that some patients may present after three days. Incidence is 5.5% all the way to 32% without imaging guidance, but this is reduced to 2.2% when imaging guidance is used. There are several risk factors, including age, it's more common in younger patients, sex, it's more common in women, and other risk factors include a previous history of post-LP headaches, a previous history of headaches in general, and a lower BMI. Obesity is felt to decrease the incidence of these headaches. The headache is typically postural that worsens when the patient moves from a supine to an upright position. The pain is often relieved when the patient lies down. It may also worsen with physical activity, movement of the head, a Valsalva maneuver, coughing, sneezing, straining, or ocular compression. Associated features can include lower back pain, nausea, vertigo, tinnitus, hearing changes, and cranial nerve palsies due to downward traction on one or more cranial nerves. And this can lead to visual symptoms such as blurred or double vision. This headache is due to leakage of CSF through the dural puncture site, which leads to a decrease in pressure. And there's two consequences to this decrease in pressure. The first is downward pull on pain-sensitive structures caused by CSF volume loss. When CSF volume is low, especially in the upright position, gravity causes CSF to move down into the spinal dural sac. As a result, the brain loses buoyancy and sags downward as well, and this creates tension on the meninges and other pain-sensitive intracranial structures. Traction on pain fibers localized to venous sinuses and tributaries, dural and cerebral arteries, and parts of the dura contribute to the headache. You might also see compensatory vasodilatation of the cerebral vasculature, which occurs in order to maintain a constant intracranial volume. This can also contribute to the post-LP headache. Since the cerebral vasculature and its supporting structures are richly innervated, these changes lead to the painful headache. So how can we prevent this? Well, there are several technical factors. Smaller gauge needles can help reduce the incidence of headache. Atraumatic needles, as opposed to using cutting needles, can reduce the incidence. And remember the needle orientation. I mentioned that earlier, that the bevel of the needle should be oriented parallel to the long axis of the spine in order to reduce injury to the dural fibers. And finally, replace the stylet before removing the needle. Other features such as post-procedural bed rest, hydration, patient position during the LP, the volume of CSF removed, and the number of attempts have not been shown to be associated with the post-LP headache. Most of these headaches resolve within a week with no treatment or with conservative management such as rest, hydration, and symptomatic treatment. So there are risks of not treating this headache. The first is a chronic headache or back pain. The second is a cranial subdural hematoma because the downward traction of the brain can lead to rupture of the subdural bridging veins. These patients can also get cerebral venous sinus thrombosis and chronic cranial nerve palsies. Conservative management includes bed rest, although the effect may be transient. Oral hydration is something to think about, but remember, normal hydration should be maintained. There's no evidence of benefit from excessive fluid administration. Abdominal binders can be used because they're thought to work by increasing pressure within the spinal canal, but these can be cumbersome. And oral analgesia, both simple and opioid analgesia, can be used as well as antiemetics. Caffeine may work by cerebral vasoconstriction and increased CSF production, but oral therapy should not exceed 24 hours. And other medications listed here have been used, but there's not enough evidence to support their use. So oftentimes we're turning to an epidural blood patch, and this procedure involves injecting a patient's own blood into the epidural space in order to raise intracranial pressure.
there's two possible mechanisms as to why this might work. The first is the plug theory. And in this case, the injection leads to formation of a blood clot, which acts as a gelatinous tamponade, sealing the dural tear and preventing further CSF leakage. The CF, CSF gets regenerated and CSF pressure is restored. The other theory is the pressure patch theory. In this scenario, the blood acts as a mass lesion, which compresses the dural sac. Spinal CSF is displaced immediately into the cranium, restoring intracranial CSF volume and pressure and providing relief. The relief is mediated primarily through a reduction in traction on pain-sensitive structures and partly by a reduction in vasodilatation. So an epidural blood patch is most effective when done more than one to two days after the LP. Success has even been reported uh, greater than a year after LP. When we ask what level should we do this at, we usually target one level lower than the LP since the blood travels several segments in both cranial and caudal directions. In fact, it travels more cranially than caudally. And we use about 20 ml of blood, but remember that volumes as low as 7.5 milliliters can be effective and can potentially result in a lower incidence of nerve root irritation. The success rate of an epidural blood patch is high and is quoted at 77 to 97 percent. If symptoms don't improve within two days, it's likely that the procedure has failed, either from using the wrong location, incomplete tracking of the blood within the epidural space, or from creation of a further dural puncture. It may also be due to the fact that the headache is not due to the LP. One more point is that it's a good idea to have these patients rest for two hours after an epidural blood patch, because this may improve the efficacy compared with shorter periods of bed rest. There are risks to an epidural blood patch. These include meningitis, subdural or subarachnoid hematoma, cranial nerve palsies, elevated intracranial pressure, paraparesis or cauda equina syndrome, and bradycardia. People also ask about intrathecal blood injection. This can certainly occur accidentally during an epidural blood patch. This may cause pain, but it's usually self-limited. Other forms of management may include epidural morphine, SPG blocks, and greater occipital nerve blocks, but there's insufficient evidence supporting their use as treatment for a post-LP headache. And fibrin glue and surgical repair of the dural tear have also been reported. There are just a few other potential complications of an LP. The first is cerebral herniation, which I mentioned earlier, if other conditions are present. Bleeding is also a potential issue. A small volume hematoma can potentially cause significant morbidity. Patients with persistent back pain or neurologic findings after an LP do require an urgent evaluation to determine if a hematoma is present. And these patients may require surgery because timely decompression of a hematoma is essential to avoid permanent neurologic loss. The good news is that severe bleeding resulting in spinal cord compromise is very rare in the absence of a bleeding risk. So it's best to adhere to the earlier described recommendations relating to correcting coagulopathies and stopping and restarting anticoagulation and antiplatelet medication. Infection is another potential risk. Meningitis is very uncommon after LP. So just remember that some cases of post-LP meningitis have been attributed to contaminated instruments or poor technique. And studies have suggested that this may be attributed to aerosolized secretions from personnel present during the procedure, which highlights the importance of wearing a mask. Bacteremia is not a contraindication to LP. And finally, nerve injury is a potential risk. This can occur with direct injury to a lumbar nerve root or with a low-lying conus. It's related to the number of attempts to gain fluid during the LP and the degree of angulation away from the midline. The good news is that back pain and radicular symptoms, such as pain shooting down the leg, that occur after an LP typically resolve within a few days. So in conclusion, lumbar punctures are commonly performed at bedside, but a number of patients may require fluoroscopic guidance to facilitate the procedure. Now I bet you never thought you would listen to anybody talk this long about LPs, but I think it's important for those performing the procedure to understand the anatomy, the technique, the requirements for appropriate CSF analysis, and the potential risks before anyone moves forward performing this procedure.